Hey guys, welcome back to yet another episode of Top Billers Toolkit, where me and my twin brother interview top billers from all around the globe to unlock the secrets to their success. Today's guest is Alex de Golia. Alex started his own recruitment company in the banking sector and in just two years managed to turn over $1 million in revenue. And he didn't start with a silver spoon, I can assure you. After having his daughter at a very young age, he had to support a family while being absolutely dirt poor. But Alex had a vision and a dream of the life he wanted to live and he worked his ass off to achieve it. In today's episode, we're going to be discussing the most impactful and successful BD tactics that Alex has used to become a 500k biller. We're going to be exploring the insane levels of persistence and consistency it requires to bill at that level. And we'll also talk about how important mindset has been for Alex in order to hit those numbers consistently. So. As usual, guys, grab a cuppa or a glass of wine, depending on when you're listening to this, and let's jump into it, shall we? Hello, Mr. Degolia, how are you? I'm good, dudes. How are you? Really good. Very, Thank very you. good indeed. Now, uh, um, Alex is a dear friend of ours. We uh, we love you very much, Alex. Um, so not too. only do we love you, but you're a brilliant recruiter. Um, you've been through quite a journey up until this point and one big kind of stat that I love throwing out there and telling other people is that you managed to bill a million in two years in your company um, as well as help countless candidates and countless clients so um, you're a perfect person to bring on Top Builders Toolkit thank you for joining us my friend happy to be here which just to add I think for your age as well uh, Alex makes you in the top I don't know what percentage but top percentile of recruiters in terms of billing numbers mm. so uh, you should be very proud of that my friend I appreciate very cool. that yeah I was I always wonder like where do I stack up in the big scheme of things you know mm. so it's it's always it's I always appreciate hearing the outside perspective because you know you get in your own head and you're like oh god am I doing enough am I good enough and then when other people are like hey man you're doing great it's so I appreciate that yeah, yeah, you're welcome. You're always your own worst enemy, aren't you? Especially if you're competitive and, you know, you're a high achiever. It's always like you're your own worst enemy. And then when you compare it to other people, you're like, oh, wow, I'm actually not doing as doing bad okay. as I thought. You know, exactly. Right. I'm doing OK. Yeah. I'm, exactly. I'm, I'm OK. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we always start the pod with this question, um, Alex, which is what's the number one tool in your toolkit, whether it be mindset, strategy or software? What would you say to that, bro? Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about this one. Um, and I, so here's one thing that I have that I don't, that I know nobody else has. And that is integrity. Mm. Mm. Think about that for a second. She <laughs> lives upstairs. Mm. So it's my daughter. Um, <laughs> so my daughter's name is Integrity. Her nickname is Kiwi. Um, and so. I think she encompasses all of those, the mindset, the strategy, and, and even, I mean, for that matter, the software. But I think I think it's uh, you need something to keep you grounded and motivated, but also to remind you uh, outside of the professional world, like what's important. Mm. So for her, you know, I mean, and that's also the name of my company, shameless plug here, Alki Consultants. <laughs> so- Obviously, my name's Alex. Her nickname's Kiwi. And so I took the first two letters of our name. And it's it's always just to, I know it's not Al Key, it's Al Kai. There's a whole reason behind that, which I can get into if you want me to. But um, I, I mean, you know, Sam, you being a new father, congratulations, by the way. Thank I know, you, I don't know if you've mentioned that on the podcast, but I think I've said it like a hundred times. Probably. Okay. <laughs> love it. Love it. Love it. You can never say it enough, you know, yeah. and it's, it's, you just need somebody to like, be your north star i don't know mm -hmm. i don't use that word very much but it's like you you just need to be reminded on the good days and the bad days why you do it and and have somebody there pushing you and motivating you i love that man That's such a lovely answer and it's so interesting because i wouldn't have resonated with that answer as much until i realized how much sam has changed since he had his daughter um sam it's, you didn't really notice this because me and sam were at the pub the other day and i was kind of telling him and he didn't really notice any changes i was like dude you have changed like mm -hmm. completely you obviously he's still sam and he's still got all the amazing characteristics that sam had prior to having little akira but he has changed so much as a person been so much more driven and just on it with everything and i know it's because he's got akira that motivation um in the back of your head sam 
and um, it's and, it's amazing yeah. to observe it's interesting more well, psychologically it's really interesting so when you say that alex um i truly believe you and understand how much of a motivator that can be even though i don't yeah. have a child myself so thank but you, you for guys are that. so tight like i mean obviously being twins you guys have a bond that's probably beyond most human beings and i would say it, it i mean not being a twin but having a daughter it's like man you got you two and then sam and his daughter and akira probably have a similar connection and vibe that you just can't explain mm. so and even as an uncle ben i'm sure too it's like you you've changed also because now all of a sudden your brother has like i mean quote unquote like produced something that is mm. like you two yeah and that's <laughs> profound crazy. dude yeah i keep making jokes to sam that i'm her dad as well because we're <laughs> gen genetically identical even though yeah well technically right. dna wise you are <laughs> right dude it's nuts i'm like you i've know, got I'm... a daughter yeah <laughs> <laughs> when when you hold like when you guys get around each other does she look at you differently or like oh, it was so funny we we um went to visit my parents on the weekend and akira was um i basically me and sam just went in front of akira she i think it was the first second time she'd met me but first time I met her, she was a lot younger. So she wasn't as conscious right. of her surroundings. And she was just like going back and forth. She looked so confused. Like, she was like, oh, what my God. What the hell is yeah. this? Yeah. <laughs> and then she kept on looking. She didn't know who was who. And then Sam pulled a face. And then she in instantly locked eyes with Sam and was like, okay, that's my dad. It was so <laughs> funny. Yeah. That's so crazy. That's crazy. Mm. Yeah. It's, it was really it was the first time I've ever seen her do that as well. It was like proper darting from left to right it was crazy yeah you see your brain working dude yeah remember how we were talking about that when she was first born you're like i don't know this is like it's like having a little animal that you can't like communicate yeah. with because they're just literally reacting and then you start to see their yes. personality come out of nowhere yeah. but also dude the the coolest thing is watching your your baby learn and like reason and sort things out yeah. that's super cool yeah, man, it's been an absolute mm, trip, like amazing trip the last three months. It's, it's as Ben said, it's changed my whole perspective on life. Um, I would love to, we, we'll definitely come back to kids. Uh, um, yeah. Alex. I, I want to jump to, just because I think you have so much useful information to share, or at least perspective. Um, you're a top biller, you managed to bill, as I said at the beginning, one million in two years. Um what do you think have been the key components that have allowed you to hit that number? Because that's quite, I would say, an exceptional number. Not every recruiter can hit that, even working, you know, in ridiculous hours. So what's allowed you to do those numbers in two years on your own? I might add, you know, you are a one man team. You've done this all on your own. Yeah, um, it's a really good question, man, because I I always come back to uh I think it's, I think it definitely is a mindset thing. You know, like I've always believed in myself. I've, I'm my biggest critic, like Ben was saying, but I'm, I've always thought myself capable. Mm -hmm. So I think it always starts with, with believing in yourself and like just yeah. if you believe that you're the best or want to be the best and believe that you can get there, then the rest of it will follow. Mm -hmm. But I think, I truly think. Uh, you know, there's so many personalities that can thrive and succeed in recruiting. And that's what's so cool about recruiting. But for me, I'm just a very disciplined, regimented, routine oriented person. I love, you know, like I love spontaneity and I love living it up and I love, you know, doing things on a whim. But at the same time, I also like to be in my box and to, to, to have my sequence every single day. And so I think um, the keys to getting to the million dollar number uh, independently is really just diligence to the basics. It, it's mm. just doing it's it's in it. So I have a tattoo on my arm that says always a work in progress, forever in love with the process. And so mm. that is one of those things where you have to love like the in-between, right? You have a starting place and an end goal, but you have to love all of the doing first and foremost. And so for me, it's just like, I just, I love, I'm a big numbers guy. I, I know my ratios from a match and present to send out, a send out to placement, job order to placement. 
how many presentations on recruiting and marketing I need to have to get a resume, to find a job order, those kinds of things. So I love the activity of, of achieving those numbers. And then uh, I love to look back at the body of work and kind of just see, okay, where have I come from? Where am I now? What do I need to do? So mm. it's just it's just doing that. It's just daily, mundane, simple activity, but just r- like making it my religion and just doing it every single day. Mm. Love that. And if we were to jump into that a little bit deeper, um, Alex, and go into those non-negotiable daily activities, what would that look like? What would that look like if I was uh, a fly on the wall in your office? It's funny because I think over our relationship and friendship and and working together, we've kind of tried to figure out what those non-negotiables are independently and just kind of reinforce those. I think the biggest thing for me is just marketing. Um, And I I don't know what the rest of the world calls it. It's really cool to be on a a world platform versus like a, a U.S. platform. Uh, from a recruiting perspective, but I I, I guess what you would call marketing in the MRI network vernacular to the world is business development. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I I think without question, you have to market, you have to continuously find new clients, find new job orders, because without finding new clients and job orders, none, the rest of it doesn't matter. So, the biggest non-negotiable for me is always hitting my marketing goals or business development goals on a daily basis. And and I, maybe for the sake of this podcast, I recruit in banking, um, typically on the West Coast of the United States of America, but generally throughout the country, I would say more so West Coast emphasis though. Um, and so recruiting in banking Zero issues. I have zero issues talking to candidates, finding candidates, getting resumes. The hard part is finding the clients. Mm. So I try to do, and I try to do this in life too, is like, you know, the stuff you wake up and you're just like, gosh, it just nags at you. And you're like, shit, I just got to get this done. I try to do that stuff first. So Mm. then I can enjoy the rest of my day and relax. Because when I'm relaxed and I'm loose, that's that's when the boy works, you know, <laughs> like that. that's when stuff starts to flow and things start to happen. So I, I try to just make sure I find that like that one thing that I want to avoid and just head first into that. And um, I actually enjoy cold calling and marketing. Um, so I, I, I love the practice of that. I, I saw a podcast somewhere. I think his name's Dave Melzer. Have you guys ever heard of Dave Melzer? Or I, Melzer? I will check him out though. Yeah. Uh, I'll send you the clip if I can find it. But basically, he said, like, one of the biggest skills that you can have in our generation and younger is still phone skills, just Mm. calling, cold calling people and Mm. and just being able to develop rapport without seeing somebody. Mm. So I've really prided myself on on the cold calling and really like when I first started recruiting, it was like, this is the most uncomfortable, awkward thing in the world. (laughs) how do I make this to where it's comfortable? Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm riffing now, but generally speaking, try to do the hard stuff every day for sure market, because I feel like if I market and hit the marketing numbers, the rest of the numbers just kind of fall into place. Mm, really interesting. And just to delve into what that you said, you did, you do the tough, uncomfortable things in the morning, Alex, is that try to, yeah, what what does that consist of? Like, if that was someone else was like, I'm going to copy Alex and do that uncomfortable stuff in the morning. What is that uncomfortable stuff for you that you have to get done? Personally and professionally, like all of it. Yeah, both. I guess let's hear both. Okay. Of them. Well, so I've been grappling. I was just talking to my girlfriend Erin this morning about this, and it was like, man, I need to get. You, you know how we we're kind of talking about this a few months ago. You know where you just you're you're in a routine, and then all of a sudden, without knowing it, you kind of slip away from it, mm-hmm. and then you got to recalibrate. Yeah. So this is kind of a top of mind topic to me, um, uh, in general, in terms of what are those hard things to tackle. This is going to sound so weird because uh, you, I mean, look at us, very good looking bald men put together, <laughs> right? But showering. Are you kidding me? Like it, <laughs> it takes so much goddamn time. 
And it's like, it's one of those things that just nags me. Like I, as soon as I, I love to be clean, mm. I want to be showered, but it's also one of those things that's like, if I don't do it, it just hangs over me. Mm. So it's like, I get up, I make my bed. I open up all my blinds in my house. I like, I call it opening up the house. Like I start the computer, start the coffee. The f- then sometimes I slip into sitting down and drinking my coffee and, you know, then I'm fucking around on my phone and then <clears throat> then it's like, shit, what am I doing? You know, I just I, I want what I'm trying to get to is like when you wake up and get your routine, I want to be relaxed, but focused and feel like I'm in control of the sequence, mm. you know, just so then I can then I can give myself the excuse to look at my phone versus like, oh, God, I'm behind because I've been looking at Instagram for too long about stuff I don't even care about, you know? Mm, yeah. Um. So so depending on the day, it's either get up, make my bed, open up my house and go lift and come home and shower or it's get up, shower and then get to the rest of my day, because for whatever reason, the showering part just centers me once I'm like clean in my clothes, ready to go. And then I, the first thing I do after I'm like, I, once I start to work is, um, I write content and, Mm. and that's, I'm also a big intermittent faster. So I love, I try to hit, excuse me. I try to hit 10,000 steps before I eat, Mm. uh, every day. Um, and so, one of the biggest things in fasting is like, I'm super clear and locked in and creative in the morning. And so mm. I try to ease into the day, get myself centered and then write and then, and then sit down and start marketing. So, um, that's kind of the way that I get into the flow of the day is, is sit, you know, I try to write for an hour and again, I'm still trying to lock this in. So by no means to any of the listeners or Ben and Sam, I am not, perfect at this it doesn't happen every day this is pie in the sky but i would love to be sitting down at like 8 a.m writing until 9 reset sit down in my office because i have i i walk on a treadmill upstairs typically you and i you guys were all i'm walking on the treadmill talking um so i try to walk and write at the same time and get some steps and just get moving and then come down and sit down and start marketing so i feel like Marketing and match and presents. Um, I, I don't know what the rest of the world calls it, but they, but presenting a candidate to a job, I try Ooh. to get those two things done first because those are like where the active where where all the money's at, you know. Yeah, and then do mm. the rest of my day. Love that match and present. We have a slight. I'm not sure if recruiters call it in the same way. I think specking in a candidate, specking in, or maybe they have their own phrase in the UK. Can you? Go into a little bit more detail as to what that entails. I know it's probably um, <laughs> probably not that many variations, but I'd love to hear how you do it, um, Alex, in terms of your match and present task or your match and present uh, process. Yeah. Um, so by way of training, just for everybody listening, I, I come from the MRI network. Um, and so... So the vernacular that I'm using, the terminology I'm using is from the network. Um, So map, we call them maps, match and presents, specking. Basically what I do, so let's see if I can do this without knocking stuff over. I have just a simple yellow pad. And this is like my daily process. And so this is also like the bottom section. This is all where I write my content ideas. So like I'll be talking to somebody on the phone get an idea, boom, write it down. Uh, I also, just so everybody knows, I am a shitty note taker. I suck (laughs) at taking notes. I write them down and I look back. I'm like, what the hell does this mean? I have no clue. (laughs) But I also have realized that if I don't write it down, I will definitely forget about it. And I definitely won't do it. So same, same along those lines, you know, I've got certain jobs and people that I recruit. And as soon as those people come to mind to present, I'll just, boom, put them down on the piece of paper and write down the company that I want to present them to. Um, I don't know much about other industries, but uh, if I was working on a commercial loan officer position in San Francisco, California, 
or the San Francisco Bay Area of California, if I find one person, I can probably present them to five to 10 places. Mm -hmm. So understanding that, you know, um, it just depends on who I recruit, who I come across, where they fit. Um, But then it's just a simple email. Like, it's really not. I found that, um, you know, maybe my style, I'm going to preface this. I think my style is very casual compared to like a formal quote unquote executive recruitment company. So my present presentation is like, Hey, Sam, see attached. It's Ben, you know, see attached Ben Miller. And he's interested in your position. Let me know when you want to talk to him. Just very (laughs) assumptive, stupid, simple messaging. And then Mm. if I, then I, then if there's questions, then I follow up and have a conversation. Um, So it's, it's just like that. It's just simple like that. I've also been recruiting for nine years, so I've got a lot of rapport and I don't have to be as formal with people as I used to be Mm. because I've been in the game a little bit longer and have some longstanding clients and relationships too. Yeah. What I find interesting about that, Alex, is um, most people when they're pitching candidates or sending any kind of email usually send like a bloody 10 paragraphs, don't they? And yours is like so casual, it catches them off guard is what I think is going on. It's like, oh, this guy is not trying too hard and it's very casual. And there might be some other things going on that I'm not aware of. But that's the kind of first thing that comes to my mind. You're, you're not doing what every other recruiter does, which is pitching the hell out of it and sending them paragraphs of emails. Um, and that is like both a personal and professional aspiration and value of mine always is to be as authentically me as I can be Mm. and also realize and like be different I want to be different I want to make sure that when I connect with a candidate or or a hiring manager that they're talking to Alex DeGolia not recruiter Alex not professional Alex I mean you know we all have our professional voices at times but it's like as much as 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 quickly as I can get into being authentically me the better because then you can actually relate to people and understand what they want and people's guards are let down and you, you, you know, not that I'm trying to like gotcha moment, but it's like, (laughs) I want to hear, I want to hear what, like what their pains are both, Mm. you know, from a company perspective and a candidate perspective, like what the hell do you want? Like, I'm okay with being told no, but you got to tell me what you want. So when I find something, we know it's a good fit for everybody, you know? Mm. Um, But to your point, Sam, like, being too wordy there's so much shit out there like Mm. i was just talking about being distracted by this damn thing you know it's like it's the coolest thing in the world but it's also extremely distracting and how do you cut through all that you know Mm. it's by by being too wordy nope nobody has the 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 bandwidth or the attention span to read this much why not read this much and get them on the phone Mm. like the whole goal is to get somebody to talk to you that that's it You know, Mm. so I'm not trying to educate somebody or elaborate on a position or or anything. I'm just trying to get them to talk to me and then I'll explain it. Interesting. Mm. From the feedback you've had from clients and the people you've spoken to, Alex, what do you think out of the. What do you think gets you ahead to to because you I think you're simplifying this process and I'm sure it is a simple process, but I'm sure there's a lot of finesse and or other areas that we haven't touched upon but if there was one thing that gets you in front of these clients and gets them responding is it the authenticity is it the volume is it the quality of candidates is it all of the above what do you think gets you that meeting do you think persistence Mm, interesting you know i think what one thing that cuts through always is like barriers of entry to recruiting are very low it's not hard to get into the game Mm. But what you have to do, and and everybody gets a phone call, but I've been calling, t- <laughs> I was just telling somebody this the other day, like, I've legit been calling people, like, three times a month for nine years and never talked to them. Oh, wow. But God damn it, they know my voice, you know? <laughs> and at some point, at some point, there will be an opportunity for us to work together. So for me, the, in my mind, I'm always going with that mindset of, like, you don't need me now. And I get that you're not responding, but at some point you're going to need the boy. 
and we're going to work together somehow, you know? So I think it's, I think it's persistence. It's like, all it is, is, you know, and I'll even tell you my sequence. I'll send, like, let's say uh, I use the, the CRM system, PC recruiter or PCR. I send in a roll up, I send a e-blast. So it's like an email with like highlighting the candidate. I'll call all those people three times and then I'll send <laughs> the same email after those that those three uh, calls. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes I hear from people, sometimes I don't. I'm sure it pisses a lot of people off, but also, you know, people just, if the is suit, I always say this, if I don't hear from you, I am going to haunt your dreams. <laughs> but as soon as you tell me no, I, I fine. Uh, I'll be in touch with you again later, you know? Yeah. So I think it's I think it's consistent and persistent communication to the clients. Mm. So that that um line alone showed me how persistent you are, is that you said you called the same person three times for nine years or whatever. Like that's insane. This is crazy. But that's and it's really interesting when I hear and listen to other top billers that that's the level of persistence and consistency you need in order to get to that level. Um, I had a question. It's completely gone out of my brain. I'll jump in. I've got one. So Damn don't it. worry, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really interesting. So and what about cold calls, Alex? What, what do you let's say you call them and someone actually picks up the phone? You don't have to say word for word. But what is that kind of? What's the tonality? What's the opener? What do you what do you say to them to kind of get their attention? Is it just referencing the candidate or is it something else? Yeah, I am. Um, so so here's something that's important to me, too. Uh, before recruiting, I was not in any sort of sales capacity. I've never been a, a, a quote unquote salesman. Uh, well, I think in, in evaluating my life, I have done sales without realizing it. But but when I first came into the game, I came from an eight and a half year career in higher education. And so, so the biggest thing for me was trying to sound natural, relaxed, and not too salesy mm. because I don't want to be like, Hey, Ben, Alex Degolia here from Alpine <laughs> Consultants. How are you? You know, like radio voice. Uh, but I, so I just want to be as casual as possible. And, and, and granted, I can be, I can, I can and should be better about this, but like, if you pick up the first thing I say, and I know a lot of people say like, don't say, how are you? But it's like, Hey Ben, this is Alex Degolia from Alki consultants. How are you? I'm good. Alex, how are you? I'm good. Hey, I'm calling, uh, I'm an executive recruiter and I'm calling you because I'm working with a blah, 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 blah. And I just go right into my pitch and I, and I do pretty assumptive, cl uh, closing questions. Like, so I wanted to see when you wanted to speak with this person, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, you know, it's like, Oh, we're not interested. And I don't know. The old sales way is like hit them three times and make them tell you no three times. Because, you know, when you walk into a grocery store and somebody's like, hey, Ben, do you need any help? The first thing you do, even if you do, you're like, no, nah, I'm good. And it's like, you know, so you got to kind of break that down. But I'm also like, man, I, I don't want to be a dick on the phone either, you know. So it just depends. I, I kind of like have that opening and then I try to see how they react. And if, if I can kind of weasel my way into getting another no, I will. Or if I can just leverage that conversation into like, if you don't need this, what do you need? Mm. Okay, you're not hiring. When do you plan on hiring? You know, I try to I try to be like, just tell me no, fine. But I try to keep them like in, in the MRI network and on PCR, you have this thing called a five point. And it's basically five questions that you ask everybody, like everybody in, in the world is worthy of a five point. So I try to like stay on the phone for like five minutes. Like, can I just get to the five minute mark and ask enough, even if it's the most awkward, you know, angry conversation, can I, can I get to five minutes? So that's what I try mm. to do. That's really interesting. Love that. Absolutely um, love that. I remember my question. Thank the Lord. Um, <laughs> what I wanted to know, Alex, was, uh, your persistence was was kind of highlighted in my brain. Have you tracked how much of your business has come from the initial point of contact versus the follow up? Because my my instinct is telling me you're persist you're so persistent. There must be a ton of business coming from the follow up. But do you know roughly like where the business is coming from? That's a really good question, dude. Um, so 
of my almost nine years in recruiting, I spent six and a half of those at management recruiters of Coeur d'Alene in mm-hmm. the MRI network. So I don't have that data anymore. Um, so the only frame of reference I have now is from Alki Consultants. And I don't know offhand, but I would I would say just based on gut feeling and just general knowledge, it mm-hmm. it's not that first call. Mm, it's it's very rarely that first call. Wow. Yeah, that's what I suspected. That's really you know, that's it's really interesting. it's probably okay. I, I, like I remember in the beginning of my career, I called this guy, and he finally answered and was like, "Nah, we're not looking for that. Look for this." I'm like, okay, you know, and I found that. It wasn't good. Reflecting back, I'm like, that was a shit candidate. I had no clue what the hell I was doing. But I thought he I thought he was what he was asking for. So I called him and he finally was like, all right, you got one. And he said, OK, let's put an agreement in place. So it's like it's it probably takes one to three conversations for me. And I don't know if that's good or bad. I, it's just the way that it kind of works with me is like that first call. If I'm calling Ben, it's like I just want to I'm going to pitch somebody. You tell me what you want, what the culture's like. Okay, cool. Regardless, I'm going to call you again with somebody different. And we're just like, I kind of chip away at it. I call it, uh, there, there's a phrase called keep chopping. Basically, mm. if you keep swinging that axe, eventually the tree will fall. So mm-hmm. I'm just like, I'm a brick by brick, swing by swing kind of guy. Um, mm-hmm. So it's probably one to four conversations. Mm, really interesting. And... Very rarely, it's in the it's in the initial point of contact. It's all to, it's all in the follow up. Just really, if good. it's if it's initial, like the initial contact, it's it's typically when people reach out to me, like, "Hey, we're looking for mm. this." Yeah, you know, which is a different. It's not cold calling, but yeah, um, very rarely do I pitch somebody the first time and just like make a forty thousand dollar placement and move on with my life. Very <laughs> rarely does that happen. I can't yeah. even think. So in the MRI network, we call it the impact player. And it's mm-hmm. basically the the candidate who's got the skill sets that are desired in the market that you call people about. Mm-hmm. Um, by the way, I I never call anybody without a reason. I, I hate checking in, following up. Mm. or just like, hey, just wanted to see what's going on out in the market there. Like, <laughs> I'm never calling somebody back like that. I'm <laughs> calling you because I got a fucking reason to talk to you. Um, really interesting. But very rarely, I, I don't even know if I've ever placed an impact player. Mm. Maybe one to two. Like for me, the impact player is the reason to call somebody and open the window, oh, open the conversation up. And then I then I place typically after that initial. So the impact player is super valuable. I feel bad because I never place those people, but you know, they're, uh, yeah. So it's very rarely like, I, you know, my whole life I've never been, Oh, Alex is just going to show up and ball out and just win. I I'm, I have to show up and work for it. So mm-hmm. that's just kind of how my desk flows also. Love that two biggest things just to recap for everyone that I got from that Alex was your, the money's in the follow-up. So consistently following up if they, if they don't say yes, the first time, second time, third time, fourth time, and most importantly is having a reason. Well, not most poorly, as importantly, having a reason to jump back on the call. Because you said that if the first candidate isn't right, you're coming back with another one. Like you're not just going back saying, hey, what else do you, you know, you're going back with intent and a good product, which is a brilliant candidate, which I just find really interesting. Yeah, because yeah. sometimes like that initial call, right? You got a commercial loan officer or whatever. And mm-hmm. they're like, well, we're not looking for a loan officer, Alex. We need a a deposit operations manager. Mm. So I dive into that. And, and then I either, if I've got somebody, and this is one thing that I love about recruiting, and this is how my head works. I have, I have a really, really good memory. And so if somebody says, I'm looking for this, this, and this, uh, very rarely do I go, I don't know anybody. Like there's times where I'm like, oh shit, I can think of like five people right now that I could present. So I try to pivot immediately and go, well, you know, I, I am working with somebody who's, who's blah, 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 blah. Would you want to talk to somebody like that? And then that, to me, that's the leverage to get the fee agreement in place and then start the, the process. Um, Interesting. 
So, but sometimes it's just casually like, ah, you know, just kind of flippant. We're looking for this. Let us know if you ever find somebody. It's like, well, okay, you know, and then uh, sometimes I'll call with just like, I just go on these campaigns. So I have a new impact player. Boom. I'm calling everybody that that's relevant. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I don't know if people are going to like this back in the day. And still sometimes I'll call the wrong person on purpose, meaning if I have a commercial loan officer and I'm calling a chief lending officer, you know, that's a relevant connection, but I'll also call the chief financial officer and mm. he'll be like, what the hell are you doing, Alex? This guy doesn't report to me. You should call so-and-so. Okay. <laughs> you know, cause sometimes you'll call the chief lending officer. He won't answer. You call the CFO and he's like, don't bother me, Alex, call Ben. And then he'll mm. give me Ben's information. Then I can get into Ben, right? Very good. Or they can give me another job order. Well, we don't, loan officers don't report to me. Well, who do report to you? Who does report to you? Boom, they tell you the different roles. What are you looking for in your department? Boom, here's what we're looking for. I mean, you just, Interesting. you know. Wow. Has that worked uh, a few times, Alex? That oh, one? dude, yes. Really? Wow, that's yeah. fascinating. And, and, if, and, and so I'll define what I define as working, right? For mm -hmm. me, what working is, is having a conversation and learning something. That's mm -hmm. a win for me. I don't care if it's money or not. Because I feel like the money will come if I'm learning and having dialogue and expanding on each conversation. Mm -hmm. So if I learn something or get like some more insight, contact information, updated cell phone, whatever, that's a win for me. That's a successful call. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it's that. a bad number, that's a successful call. Like, mm -hmm. cool. Because I know this number sucks. Boom. It's out. Right. I love that. I love that, mate. Yeah. Big mindset shift. Um mm -hmm. One thing I'd love to get your perspective on, Alex, but especially because you are and have been such an advocate of cold calling and a lot of the kind of old school recruitment tactics, but a lot of your focus, especially this year and half of last year was content and building your brand. Um, mm -hmm. For someone that has come from, you know, the old school recruitment tactics and still advocates for a lot of them, why did you start, decide to start building your brand and what's the difference between brand building and cold calling? Like, why should a recruiter even consider doing that? Man, I think, so back in the day, it used to be to legitimize yourself in any business is to have a website, right? Hmm. You still need a website. It doesn't have to be crazy, but you still need one. Um, and then it was, you need a website and a LinkedIn. You know, you don't need a crazy LinkedIn, but you still need one to be legit because if somebody looks you up, they want to at least see that you exist. <laughs> We'll get into that later, but it doesn't have to be anything elaborate. But I think one thing that's super important, um, and and for me, I'm a I tr I'm creative. I love to make music. I've loved to like make. When I was a kid, I, I I was just telling other people about this. I I've always liked to write lyrics and rap. I've always liked to film videos and edit and like just make stuff. Mm. So for me content is like the adult version of being creative you know mm. and and so uh and, and you two have really helped me with this find my voice professionally because i've always i think for me personally i feel like i've got a unique story i think we all do but I, I love to tell my story where i came from who i am because being authentic resonates with people and and they don't forget me we do business you know we'll, we'll eventually work together uh, i can't tell you how many recruiters i've talked to that have said like I, yeah man i'm looking at this opportunity i just I, I, what the hell is the name of the company that i'm working with it's like dude i don't want anybody to not talk to me and be like oh alex is my guy like i talked to alex digolia at alki consultants and they at least remember me like he had an opportunity i'm not into it but like they at least can talk to another recruiter and say my name, you mm -hmm. know? So, so in a long winded answer, uh, branding is just another way of legitimizing who you are and, and showing insight into how you work, what you know, uh, but also who you are. And it helps you cut through all of the noise that's out there that we were just talking about, right? Like, how do you stand out? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you two, and I know that this is not the the, the point of the, the podcast, but you two have really helped me gain a confidence about talking professionally. And I can't tell you guys, 
I probably hear this every day now is like, dude, I love your content. Keep posting. We love what you post. We love your message and the way that you say things. And, and, you, and this is my style, but everybody's like, you just tell it like it is. And we love that because there's sometimes I post and I'm like, oh shit, this can be bad. You know, it's like <laughs> a bomb dropping, you know, cause I, cause I shit on the industry sometimes and, and, and cause I get pissed. And then other times I compliment and I try to come at it from all angles, but I try to do it in like, if Ben, Sam and I were drinking a beer together, what would I say? You know? Um, but I think what's what's really uncomfortable is posting. I, I feel like a kid from Dillon, Montana, because that's where I grew up. I just I feel I, I'm 36 years old. I feel like that 17, 18 year old kid still, but also like with a little bit more experience and knowledge. So I'm like, I'm confident, but I'm still like, I'm just as my as my daughter would say, like I'm just a kid. Like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. That's what I feel but, like, too, dude, sometimes. Yeah, yes. <laughs> But you guys were both like, dude, uh, you are an expert. You are good at this. And I think every single one of us as recruiters have a unique perspective and take on things that we should be posting Um, because it's educational. It's helpful. It's also like, I don't want to work with people who aren't ready for me to push back a little bit, you know, Mm -hmm. like, especially for a company standpoint, like, because recruiters, because of barriers of entry, there's a lot of shitty recruiters out there. And then you get lumped in with them and treated like that. And it's like, no, 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 I'm not about to take that. You know, so like part of it's putting respect on your name. Part of it's articulating that you are an expert and then you try to be helpful and authentic along the way. So uh, I know I'm just going on and on and on here, but I think content just like a website in LinkedIn is just important to the overall brand because you as a recruiter are a brand doesn't matter what company you work for if it's you independently or you with a big firm like who you are is the brand people work with you not the company in my Mm -hmm. opinion Mm -hmm. you know and that was a huge reason i went independent was uh when i told people like hey if i leave would you guys work with me and everybody was like dude we could give a shit about what the name is above (laughs) the door we want to work with alex degolia and i was like that's everything right so Mm -hmm. like so your personal brand is your business. Mm. Yeah, I wish more recruiters started working on their personal brand before they went out into the real world. I feel like that's one of the best things they can do, not just for business owners, like for solo recruiters, but for consultants that are working in bigger companies, actually building their brand, learning how to market, learning how to get inbound, and then going out on their own. I think they're just... They would find it infinitely easier. But I think that brings me on to my next question, Alex, which is one of my favorite questions of all of them today because it gives us such a good insight into who you are as a person. Um, You told us once, you know, while you were billing, while you're billing, uh, you know, half a million pounds a year, you take time to... Dollars. Half a million dollars. Sorry, sorry. My English, Get it right, my Englishness man. is coming I'm out. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, um, <clears throat> what, um, what I was saying. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. What, no, no. Don't worry. Um, what, while you're billing half a million dollars per year, um, you go to restaurants and or bars washing dishes and oh. and or serving and i just when you told me that for the first time i was like this is crazy this is so cool and so unique and so strange as well and i, I was and that. i feel like you need to tell the world why you do this yeah so so this is you guys are getting the exclusive this is uh never been put out into the uh the world aside from like my personal life so my younger brother kyle is a bartender out in Seattle, Washington. He's he work lives in the Ballard area of Seattle. And um my little brother is the most creative, fun-loving person in the world, but he's also one of the most lost people in the world. And during the pandemic, he fell into bartending and was like, you know what? He's he's done damn near everything. He's got amazing stories. He's traveled and lived all over the place. He's done all sorts of jobs and it's never been good enough and then all of a sudden, boom, he he tries bartending and it's totally his wave. He mm-hmm. 
serves people. He gets to be creative. He gets to be funny. He gets to be charismatic. He gets to be within the buzz of the social world. And, and he's starting to find his purpose. He's three years younger than me. And I've just, I've, I'm, you know, I love my little brother to death. And so it's, it's one of those things where when he finds something that he's passionate about and it gives him direction, it's like, we need to, it, we need to push Kyle that way. Like, let's just fully embrace it and go full send. And as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, man, I'm all about being independent and doing it on your own and making your own money. It's not for everybody, but I feel like my little brother can do it too. And in him becoming a bartender and finding his passion, which is in the service industry, we kind of had this idea like, dude, what if we started a bar together? You know, what if we did what you and you and Ben are doing, Sam, and just like, you know, go into business as brothers. And, you know, he's got a long way to go. He's got to still learn the industry. He's got to manage people. There's a lot of steps to that. But I, I, I just said, you know, I'll help Kyle realize his dream of being a business owner and, and embrace something that really gives him purpose. But in order for me to partner with him and start a bar and, and start a company together, like I legit need experience. I don't want to be the guy who just buys the bar and I'm like, everybody do what I tell you to. And I have no clue what the hell I'm doing, no experience, nothing. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to start. I don't want to say from the, a lot of people say like, oh, you started at the bottom and worked your way to the top. No, no, no. I started at the beginning and worked my way to the front. Mm -hmm. And so I started, I just, I just thought, you know, there's a, there's a little uh, sports bar, like two blocks away from me. I love to eat and drink there. I'm like, fuck it. I'll just apply for a job. They're always advertising. They're always hiring. So I just applied, uh, uh, yeah, making half, you know, 500,000 a year and recruiting and just was like, I'm going to go be a dishwasher or make seven bucks an hour or whatever it was, you know? And, and the whole reason was not to like, say I'm better than anybody or like I can come in and do this. It was more so like, I'm doing this for my little brother. I'm going in to learn uh, and work my way to the front and and earn it. And because I, I think what I've found throughout my life, because I've had two professional careers now, you know, one in, in higher education and one in recruiting, there are I, I don't take shortcuts. I always take the stairs. I don't mm-hmm. take I don't try to go the fast way one step at a time, brick by brick, swinging that axe. And so for me, it's like and I, you know, let me start as a dishwasher. My goal is to start as a dishwasher and work my way up to become a bartender. So I can say that I've at least done all of it. I don't want to say I'm an expert in any of it. I want to at least have perspective and understand what it's like to be in those shoes, literally be in those shoes. That way it'll make me a better business owner and it'll make me a better manager. It'll make me understand the business holistically. And even if it doesn't work out, let's just say Kyle goes his, his you know, a different direction. It's still fun because I went to this bar and restaurant, you guys, and I fucking love the people I work with. They work their asses off. It's, it's so humbling because I go in and I'm like, I can't believe these guys are living off of these wages. Mm -hmm. Like, like I only work one day a week, maybe, you know, I'm pretty particular with my schedule. I try to protect my time, make sure that I have time with Kiwi and my girlfriend, Aaron and, and, my business but if i can squeeze it in i squeeze it in and every time i go in i just like it's a burst of energy everybody's so fun it's cool you're working as a team you're working your ass off and i think that was one thing that i've always loved uh i'm I'm a big sports guy i love playing my position as part of a team Mm -hmm. and so i get that fulfillment and working in the restaurant so i've worked my way from dishwasher to line cook, I've fried chicken, made fries, made pizzas, made salads, mm-hmm. and and worked my ass off with those guys in the trenches, and realized this shit is hard. Yeah, yeah. And I've worked my way to the front now, where I'm I'm like taking orders over the phone and like hand you know kind of doing some support of the bartenders. But the ultimate goal is to become a bartender, and the whole reason is to 
gain perspective and experience and just really brick by brick build a foundation to be able to start a business with my brother whenever that that case may be but it also keeps me humble and it also keeps me young because it's hard work and you know you got to be prepared for it so it's it's it fulfills me in a lot of different ways i love that man i remember when you told me that alex it, i i found it so hard to comprehend that you were making that money and going back and washing dishes i don't know why i found it so hard i think cuz my if i was to put myself in your shoes my ego would be damaged and i'm just going to be completely honest i would like yeah. struggle to do that did you have was there any battle of the ego for you or was it like just cool because you were doing it for a greater cause and you was there any anything like that or not at all um oh, you know when you go into a situation and and i mean let's not get it twisted like i do have an ego and i've had to like work on that my entire life you know mm. but but you ever sit down in a spot and you're like drinking a beer or whatever. And you're like, man, you imagine just having a job where you don't give a shit about it. You're just like, <laughs> you come in and you have fun. And like, what, like, you know, when you're, you're a kid and you're working like these shitty jobs and you're like, if I didn't rely on this money, this could be fun. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, I kind of always fantasize like, you know how fun it would be to just be a server and just like, not give like a, a million shit. have like a million yeah. pounds in the bank and serve right. someone like crab cakes like here's yes. the crab cakes <laughs> yeah or like or get pissed at you because because they got the wrong fries and you're like i don't give a shit i don't get paid <laughs> enough to even care about you so it was like one of those things of like let's just do like a kid job but enjoy it and mm. also so when i showed up like one of my best friends from the restaurant is 19 years old shout <laughs> wow. out eggs Shout out to my guy. Shout out Eggs. eggs. Yo, and Eggs. So, <laughs> but Eggs was 18 when I showed up, right? And he was, wow. tra he trained me. Like, mm. and then another guy, Adam, shout out Adam. Uh, he taught me everything on the line, like cooking and stuff. Like, he's 24. Like, those two guys are my dogs. Like, I love mm. those dudes. Mm. But yeah, no, I walked in with no ego and just said, I don't give a shit who's telling me what to do. I want to learn this. So, Love I don't I, I'll play my position, man. Like I have no issues with people telling me what to do and showing me how to do stuff or chastising me, whatever, because I'm in their world and I'm not about to go in and be like, well, I'm like, I make way more like I'm not too good for the place is what I'm getting at. It's mm -hmm. like I, I love going in and just being a, an anonymous employee that gets pushed around like and yeah, I don't get right. pushed around per se, but you know, but it's like. No, no ego. It was like it was if anything, it was a good like centering experience mm. to go in and just like and this is crazy, you know, mm -hmm. but it's so fun and to be a part of the culture. And also, re I respect the fact that they do that full time and like that is their well-being and their life. So I'm not about to come in and be pretentious and tell them what to do or that I'm better than whatever the job is. If they want me to clean toilets bro, I'm cleaning toilets. Like I don't have any issues with that. Love that, man. I feel like that story, when you told me that, it gave me a whole different perspective of who you are as a person in I a good way. That. Like I learned so much about you, your morals, your ethics, what you're prepared to do, how you want to learn your mindset. Like that's why it was so, I told, I remember getting off the phone to Ben and being like, Ben, did Alex tell you the story? And it was like, I just told him everything. It was, but in a cool way, it was like amazing. Yeah, um, dude. <clears throat> life's work right life is constant yeah. work and so i think as soon as i heard that and accepted that it's like my mindset has changed on everything like you just keep working every day and just just keep stacking those days together and that's when the good things happen you know 100 mm, dude um i can't believe we're coming to the end of the pod there's a, a one other area i kind of want to dive into alex and it was um a few moments in your life because we've had a few conversations about your journey up until this point. And one that comes to mind was when you visualized the boat, the house and the car, and you told me there were specific moments of you visualizing it. Can you tell me that story? Like, how did it come about? And can you just, for all the people that don't know, can you just unfold that story for people? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, my daughter was born at when I was 20 years old. And so she, I've not achieved anything in my adult life without Kiwi and Toe. And when I, I, I kind of was forced into higher education, you know, it was, it was 08, you know, we were in a recession. I don't know if 
it, we're in a recession and it was, things were not good. You know, I was still in college, uh, could not find a job. And so I got into higher education and in higher ed, um, it, it, the, uh, the culture is different. The goals are different. The goals mm -hmm. are always, and, and they're not, they're noble goals. They're to help people. And it's all about the other, like the output and to see the, you know, your hard work and how it impacts people. And I think I've taken that into recruiting because that's just as important to me. Like, it's so cool to be able to help a company achieve their goals and help an individual improve their life and have had a hand in that, like, and mm. get fucking paid for it. Are you <laughs> kidding me? It's so cool. But one thing you really couldn't talk about was financial goals. Like I wanted to climb the ladder in higher education and one day become a president because that's where the money was. Like I, you know, I have a problem with working in a noble industry, but not making enough money. Mm. You know, like my girlfriend mm. was a teacher and she was scrounging to survive and had to leave the industry. Like there's something wrong with that in, in the United States of America. We need to pay these professions more because they make such an impact on our youth and our people. But the culture was never about you, you could you just couldn't talk about your personal goals. But I was like, man, yeah, you know, I've grown up with a young daughter. We were struggling. I'm in I'm working my ass off in college and work and I'm 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 still struggling to make ends meet. So if I'm going to work hard, I might as well get paid for it. Mm. And that's and I always have had these these tangible goals. I feel like if you set a goal, it's like it's got to be just out of reach. Like you can get there, but with some effort. And so I kind of, I started kind of visualizing, like, what did I want out of my career and my life? Like, what was that next step? And I was 28 years old when I started recruiting. And I just had, for some reason, I just unconsciously had this vision of, I want a house and park next to the house is a boat and in front is a BMW. And I don't know why it was those things. Like I live in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, in the panhandle of Idaho, in the inland northwest of the United States. And we have a lake, like literally for me, it's a seven minute walk. There's a tourist lake, like a huge tourist attraction here. Like Kim Kardashian lives on the other side of the lake, Mark Wahlberg, you so name cool. it, they come here and visit, right? But it was always like as a kid, as a young man walking by the lake, I'm like looking at the lake going, man, I can't wait to have to make it and have enough money to be out on the water and not, and, and look at people from my boat on the shore and not be looking from the shore out on people on their boats. And as soon as I got out on a boat, it changed my life because just the culture, the lake culture, being out on a boat, it's just so freeing. And so it was just like, I built this vision in my head um, and I think it's important to have noble goals of helping people to keep perspective and keep you grounded, but you also have to have tangible goals to go get it right. Like, mm -hmm. you, you, like there's, there's nothing wrong with stroking the ego every once in a while. Like you need a healthy balance of keeping the ego damped down, but also like, man, I'm going to flex on these hoes for a little bit, you know, like you need a little <laughs> bit of both. You need a little man. bit of both. And so, yeah. And so that was it. Like, uh, uh, that was it. I wanted to buy a house because my daughter and I have rented our entire lives and we had to move when leases were up and trying to make ends meet. And I just wanted her to have her own bedroom, you know, mm -hmm. and have her own, you know, now she's got the entire upstairs. Like, um, I, I just wanted these tangible things that, that, you know, money doesn't help or money isn't everything, but it's your helps, you know? And so, <laughs> It's yeah. uh, it, that was it, you know. So it's like I, over time, is it exactly what I visualized? No, but do I have those things now? Yes, and I'm so happy with those. Like, it doesn't have to be. You don't have to have the million dollar mansion or the the newest car. Like my BMW is a 1998 BMW Z3. I call it my sexy little summer car. I literally <laughs> I use it like May through August, and then it's too cold and snowy here to use. But it's like man, putting the top down and just cruising and just listening to music, either with my girlfriend or my daughter next to me. It's like, there's nothing better. And then being out on the water. So it's, it's, you know, you're just, you gotta constantly 
strive for something. I feel like um, mm. it doesn't stop. It'll never stop. You got to accept that it won't stop and you're never going to be fully settled or fully make it. I fully accept that, but dude, there's nothing like being out on the water and, and, you know, driving to my boat with the top down, you know? And when Love you guys, nice. when you two come to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, we're getting coming. out on a boat. And guess what I'm doing that. right now, sirs? As soon as we get done, I'm going to go sign off and buy a new boat. Hey, hey really? Like I was going to ask, what's cool. next on your visualization? Is it a I new just, boat? just bought a new boat, my oh, guys. Oh, congrats, amazing. man. That's, That's so, so cool. good, bro. That's That's cool. Yeah, dude. That's so, so amazing. It's, it's bigger. It's open bow. I'll, I'll send you a picture, but oh, it's yeah, like, please. man, you just got to keep upgrading, right? Like in, in but never forget where you come from and never forget why you started. Like, that's the most important thing is just, I love reflecting and being like, God, I, Kiwi, like I, I always tell her, like when you were small, we were so poor. Mm. And she's like, daddy, I don't remember that. I'm like, thank God. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I think I did something right with her. Like she doesn't remember the struggle, but like mm. we can't forget it. You know, yeah, hundred percent. Just, just keep and just keep that in mind. Just remember where you came from, and and know that like you're still working and you're still successful. But just don't forget it. So it's like, yeah. So what's next for me? Well, I just got a boat, um, and I don't know, man. I think it's uh, just about living and loving, baby. Mm. You know, just continuing to refine myself and and work on myself and work hard and reap those benefits. See, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I have a general outline, but I'm also not sure. Uh, I think I know that I'm just trying to create momentum to propel myself into the future. And I'm not sure where that is yet. Cool, dude. It's because you got okay. the boat. So you're like, yes, my life's complete. Okay. Oh, dude. Yeah, yeah. That's it. That's a wrap. That's it. It's done. <laughs> Alex, thank you so much, my friend. This has been oh, one of my favorite podcasts, if not my favorite podcast because of our relationship and because of you just being the coolest person in the world i appreciate Um, it man yeah thank you so much for coming on this much love for which is you brother so thank you yeah man i really enjoyed the combo oh dude me too i I love whenever we just for the listeners it's like whenever we get together to try to do a business meeting we spend the first 45 minutes (laughs) just talking about life 55 minutes talking the last five minutes we're like oh shit we got actually what what were we supposed to do so i i hope this had some direction and helps people today but man I, i respect and love both of you guys very much and love working with you thanks brother hey guys thanks for tuning in to this episode If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and Spotify. Tune in for another episode next week, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Peace and love.